everybody. Welcome to um, our, our quarantine class. Um, hopefully this week the lighting will be a little bit better than my video last week. Um, today I wanted to focus on some carving techniques that are particularly good for using with clear or translucent glazes such as celadon. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Greenwich House's Cone 10 glaze selection, we have two different celadons available. We have a nice light clear green and then we have a darker green. Um, we also have a Cone 10 clear that has a slight green tinge to it, which is like a sort of celadon light. And um, celadons, of course, have a really, really long and diverse ceramic history. I think that uh, they're, they're really interesting for the sort of technical aspect of iron oxide that is exploited by, or was exploited, or yeah, I guess still is, since people still making fire celadons. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, the capacity for iron to turn many different colors under different specific firing conditions is one of the things about celadons that is so interesting to me. Another thing that's interesting is the glaze tends to get darker when it's thicker, so it responds really, really, really well to surface texture, where if you have various sort of heights of your piece, glaze will either pull or break accordingly, and you can really, really get a, a sort of deceptive depth to your surface that is really, really difficult to achieve otherwise. So this is just a slab of porcelain that I punched out. You can see that it's, it's, it's fairly thick. It's about, it's about half an inch thick. This is just so we can really go nuts with texture. Um, you know, this is just a slab, but you can also have, you know, do this on a form. Um, I just thought for demo purposes, slab would be easier. Over to my right, I have this sort of glancing light that will hopefully enable you to see texture as I do it. And then to my left, I have another light that's, um, you know, making my skin look like, like I just crawled out of a pond or something um, that will hopefully help in, you know, my, my working hand not, not blocking everything that I'm doing. Um, so before we get started with the base drawing that will ultimately turn into a playground for Celadon, I just do want to talk very, very briefly about the history of the glaze. Um, it dates to, well, I guess true Celadons date to the Song Dynasty, so around the 10th century. And they, you know, this is a term that can be used to refer to glazes that are largely clear or translucent, often with like a little bit of a crackling or crazing and have a greenish tint. And that greenish tint can range from a light green to a dark green. However, in the archeological record, we have glazes that are now referred to as protocelodons going back about 700 to 900 years earlier than the Song Dynasty celadons. Um, those glazes, also sort of exploit that same iron oxide chemical reaction, um, but not always quite as successfully as later celadons do. So for anybody who's actually seen iron oxide as it occurs in clays, as it occurs in deposits out in nature, I'll show you what it looks like. It's this it's it's just it's just you know red rust red but under different firing conditions it can turn a whole wide variety of colors in the first place in the second place it does occur naturally in different forms like black iron oxide yellow iron oxide however for the most part when you fire iron oxide of pretty much any variety in an oxidized atmosphere what you get 
whether you use red, black, or yellow iron oxide, you sort of get like a brownish color. You, you know, you don't really get this like bright red that you're seeing here. Um, you know, you get a, a beautiful sort of rusty dark brown. Um, however, when a glaze containing a small amount of red iron oxide is fired under reducing conditions, those iron oxide molecules lose, I'm sorry, those, yeah, the iron oxide loses an oxygen molecule and trans, transforms from ferric to ferrous iron, iron three to iron two, you might say. And with that shift comes a color change. And that color change is responsible for moving red iron oxide to more of a, a black, dark gray color. Now, when a very minute amount of that is suspended and spread out throughout a clear glaze, that color has a greenish tinge rather than a gray, which you might expect if you water down something that's black, perhaps. Um, many celadons do have a bit of a gray cast to them, but they're usually like a gray green. Again, celadons have a really wide variety of expressions. And those protocelodons that I mentioned before, they sort of comprise everything that iron can uh, bear in a firing. They could come out brown, yellow, yes, green, but um, there was no sort of necessarily like striving for like a consistent jade color, which you do see in later celadons. Um, so anyway, a lot of decorative techniques sort of rose up to exploit this uh, beautiful color shift and, and depth that could be created from that. So today we're just gonna do a little carving again on, on porcelain. And as a side note, I would like to mention that Greenwich House is taking orders once again for anybody who is in the New York City area and needs some clay. Uh, they will be taking orders for 50 pounds of white stoneware, uh, standard 182, and 50 pound orders of um, cone tent porcelain. So if, if anybody's needing some clay, I recommend you do that. They'll bring it right to your door, pretty awesome. So there's that. Uh, you know, you can also carve, you, you'll be able to use these carving techniques, of course, with white stoneware. I'm only using porcelain today because I just had like a little bit that was like sort of on the edge of reclaim. Um, that I kind of wanted to get rid of. And also, I think it'll just be easier for you to see what I'm doing. Um, so I picked a sort of image that I think will lend itself to um, the different textures that can be created for celadons. Um, I'm just gonna do, you know, some of my typical fare, a volcano. That way we can get in um, you know, the angles of the mountain, some puffiness of the eruption cloud. We can throw in a little background. And, you know, maybe we'll make this volcano sticking out of water so we can do some water and depth that way too. So that'll allow us to cover a few different things. And what I can do, um, I have my pad on a turntable. So if it's driving you nutty to watch me carve up a thing upside down and backwards, I'll spin it around every now and again. Um, all right. So, yeah. Volcano time. So I'm just using a really wide ball stylus for this part. Really, really big stylus. This um, allows me to put down a firm line without cutting too deeply into my clay. Um, I don't wanna necessarily gouge super deep into my clay at this phase. I just wanna lay down like a little bit of a, a guidance for when we do get to carving. All right, there's my volcano. I am gonna grab the tape measure so I can make a straight line. Throw in a little horizon line here. And of course, if you're, if you're capable of drawing a straight line on your own, no need for a little, no need for a little tape like this. All right, there's my horizon line. And um, there's many different kinds of volcanic eruptions. 
I'm going to make this one probably be something, something somewhat like a Pliny interruption. And of course, a Pliny interruption is the type of eruption that covered up Pompeii all those years ago, where a column about a mile tall was shot up into the air, and then everything sort of sprinkled back down, which is how Pompeii was covered with so much ash fall. All right, so we have this and, uh, you know, once we get rolling a little bit, I'll probably throw in some carved details of, you know, things falling out of the sky and whatnot. Um, but in the meantime, so if you can see this so far, you know, just, a, just, a, just a sketch of a volcano. I'm also gonna throw some clouds in the background. Um, that's gonna give us a basis to talk a little bit about different ways we can create depth through flatness versus carving in color. I'm adding my uh, sort of preferred cloud motif these days, which could probably be described as a, as a heavy metal fog, which also is a good descriptor for what the world feels like these days. Okay, so if we were to fire this and glaze this now with a celadon, the celadon would get caught in these, you know, granted fairly shallow lines and you'd see like a little bit of a drawing, but we're going to make this much cooler. And again, we have about a half inch to work with. Obviously, I'm not going to carve all the way down into this, but uh, we'll get a pretty decent thing happening. Um, so for uh, detailed illustration like this, I like to work from the back forward. So we look at what is in the background of this image and it is our sky, of course, and then the water back here. Whereas the volcano is in the foreground and of course this puffy volcano cloud is also in the foreground and this is sort of mid ground as well as parts of the volcano. We really wanna cut away to make things look like they pop so first we'll talk about texturing the sky. Now, if we do nothing at all, like I said, and just fired this as is, the celadon is gonna create a really, really light, even coat. When celadon doesn't have a space to crawl into little nooks and crannies and, and is just pulling on the uppermost surface of a thing, that's where you get your lightest color effects. So I want our heavy metal fog to have that sort of color effect, but I do want the sky to be much darker and deeply textured. So that's gonna be the first thing that we carve out in, in creating our depth here. So to bang out the sky, I'm gonna use this little loop tool. So the tools that I will be using for carving all come from the Kemper Mini Ribbon Kit. It's a set of six tools. Here I think is all of them. And, and for anybody who's taken my classes, you know that I love these and show for these pretty much all the time. Um, you can get the set for, I wanna say like 10 or 15 bucks. And they'll last you a while, they're fun to use. And, uh, and yeah, that's all I gotta say about that. So now I'm just gonna go through and bang out this background. And again, one reason that I like to consider the back to front first is because when we move on to the next step, we'll be able to clean up the segues between the section we worked on and the section that's in front of that. And so a lot of your carving with porcelain, um, it's probably gonna be easiest to do when your porcelain is leather hard. Um, that way you're not gonna get any sort of, you know, unattractive little blips and sticky parts. But, you know, this is a demo, so I'm not gonna worry about that too much. And honestly, you know, of all the clays that you can carve up for this sort of a thing, porcelain is probably gonna be the easiest to work with when it's not leather hard, if, if you know, that's the position you're in. And you know you might be in that position if you have you know wrist problems or something like that. Um, 
you might be in that position time-wise. Who knows? Who's, who's to say? Clean up this edge a little bit. So now I'm just taking my large stylus again and cleaning up this edge around my heavy metal fog. And when that's a little drier, that, that little crispy edge, I'll go in and clean that out. I'm gonna try to avoid it for this section. I just make it a little bit of a deeper cut here. And here I'm also following the lines around these more foreground sections just to create a little bit of a physical barrier for when I do cut this clay out. When you carve a piece that's leather hard rather than a little under leather hard is what I'm doing here. This is definitely a little wetter than leather hard. Um, your, your little scraps will sort of release from the piece much more easily. And as you can see, I am on um, a plastic mat, which makes cleanup really super easy. so far volcano with a blown out background so now we're going to move on to the water section down here and i'm going to use um, this sort of water area as an opportunity to just use some you know very classic like drawing 101 tricks to give us a little bit of uh perspective here so to do that um you know, I, I think that water can be depicted really nicely with, uh, you know, not quite straight lines. And what I'll do is make them a little farther apart the closer we get to the eye of the viewer. And then I'll also make some little ripples around the edge of the volcano um, to show, you know, whatever ocean sea is, is, you know, reacting to this exploding island in the middle of it. So first I'm gonna do the little ripples around. And I'm just doing this with a large triangle ended tool. Um, for this, for the sort of quote unquote ocean, I just want this to be depicted in lines. And if you look up close, you can see I'm getting some crumblies on the edge. That honestly doesn't bother me too much because when this is through bisque firing, what I can do with the whole thing is just take a super fine sandpaper, sand that all away. And of course, then you'll want to rinse it off um, before you glaze it, but that'll fix that. A lot of crumbles on that one. 
but you can see maybe with a bit of this glancing light, a little bit of a perspective is starting to develop. But of course, one thing is it still looks a little flat, like we have dimension within the surface and texture, but it doesn't necessarily read as dimensional. So this is where our celadon tricks start coming in, um, celadon carving tricks. So one big important juncture we have here is between the sky here and the ocean here. Um, we want to make sure to make the sky look like it's definitely way off in the horizon and behind. And so the way that we'll do that is by making sure that we have a really stark line here once the finished piece is glazed. So we want to make sure that the celadon that's here right against the edge, the horizon of the water is a darker green while, you know, the water, we have these ridges that will pull darker green, but on that surface at, at the top of the ocean, you know, those will all be like the sort of lighter green. So what we're going to do is first make a straight cut again with this triangle tool right along the edge of the sky where the sky and the ocean meet. So I'm cutting into the sky. I am not cutting into the ocean. And I just cut, cut a line. And like the line's fine. It's giving us a little bit more definition on this side than this side. Can do the same thing to this side. But of course, definition is not all we're after here. We want to completely fool people into thinking they are gazing into a weird little ceramic porthole of a volcano erupting, or you know, whatever. Um, so again, this tool is incredibly important for this because it has this great straight edge for it and this 45 degree angle. Another great tool in the Kemper Mini Ribboning Kit is this one, uh, the little square tipped thing. So what you're gonna do is take your tool with the triangle pointed towards the section that is in your background. And what I am doing is just, get a good position here. Uh, I'm just shaving down the very top of the sky. So perhaps you can see it on this side. So I just took this, I followed that first cut we made and just shaved that off and had it fade away. So you can see then when we do cover this in celadon, it's really gonna pull there and create a lot more nice definition between the sea and the sky. We're gonna do that with everything on this, on this board. All right, All right. getting there. Um, so now we have our sky and our sea done. So I think it's a good time to move on to the actual explosion. So the next part that's behind is the explosion. I only say that because it's appearing from behind this front rim of the volcano. This section is a little bit behind the clouds. So that'll be the next part that we do. I want this to have lots of sort of like texture and curvature on the surface. So again, we're gonna use this very versatile triangle tool for that. First, much like we just did with our horizon, I'm gonna just plant a straight line and I'm going pretty deep with this. This is a, gonna be a sort of important part of the image. So I want it to read really strong, really, really dark celadon. So you can see I, I cut those lines pretty deep, a little deeper than we did for the other stuff. Um, you know, the other texture is certainly important, but I really want the volcano to be bold. And then from there, first I'm going to let this back part sort of convincingly fall away again. Again, I'm just shaving back the sky, and this time that includes the clouds as well. And I'm giving myself a little more room to have that fade sort of peter out. 
one of the things that makes depth in celadon carving so convincing is when you look at the work of these like master artisans they really make almost flat surfaces just look so alive and with various dimensions just by the way that they sort of you know fade out these transitions between pieces oh my god there's a bug on my thing All right, that's looking pretty sharp. And then again, because for this, I, oh my God, that bug, so embarrassing. Um, I do want this to look like it's a curved volumetric explosion. So I'm also gonna do sort of the same to just the edge. I'm not gonna do it quite as drastically as I did for this stuff that I want fading into the background but just a little bit, just a little bit, so we don't have that right angle cut just looking like a 2D graphic that's, that's sort of popped out. And then you can see that is, uh, you know, it's looking good, it's looking a little more in depth, but you know, we got some crumblies in there. We got some, uh, some lines. And I like my work to look super clean. So in parts that might be really hard to sand after the fact, um, you know, with our ocean part, all of those crumblies are on the top. A wipe, again, with a fine sandpaper after bisking is gonna take those right off. But with these in-depth parts, I like to use something like this to clean up those edges. This is called a finishing sponge. Uh, this is a mud tools thing. It's expensive for a sponge, it's probably like seven, eight bucks, but it is awesome and worth it. It's a super, super, super fine grained sponge that just doesn't even leave a trace that you've been putting a sponge on your work. It's really nice. And so I'm using it to sort of smear around and clean up in this little edge. There we go, that's looking better. And of course, we can always then go back in and, and define that line again, if need be. All right, so now we have like a, you know, we're starting to get a little bit of a 3D effect now. Um, I'm very excited about that. But you know, now that I have my sponge out, I am gonna clean up this juncture. And this one. All right, and, uh, I'm gonna go along and, and carve along the top of the volcano. And also this part of the cloud where the cloud is presumably in front of this erupting part. I'm also gonna carve around that. Now you might find with super curvy shapes like the uh, volcanic cloud that your stylus is gonna be a little bit better for following those lines. Um, sometimes these super straight tools will, you know, it'll be hard to cut a form without really undercutting into the clay. All right, and so now we just defined a little bit where we are, and again, I'm taking my flat edge and moving the eruption a little bit behind the front of the volcano. And because these two things are actually physically close, I want to sort of disguise the fact, um, I, I want it to sort of fade out a little bit. So I'm taking my flat edge and really, really drawing out that transition. So here we had a really tight transition. Here I used a lot of the flat edge to really take, take that, that off. I'm gonna do the same thing up here, just to demonstrate that this is behind the cloud a little bit. A 
And then going in again with my, with my cleanup sponge to get in there. All right, so we have a nice sort of transitional eruption, a pleasant, smooth, totally copacetic eruption. And uh, now we want to add a little texture to that. So I'm going to add some lines that make it look like it's, uh, you know, exploding. Um, much like our lines for our ocean, these are just going to be strong directional lines that are designed to be um, filled with glaze that's going to make a, a, a crisp, dark line. And again, I got a little bit of surface crumblies there, but you know, like I said, that's the kind of stuff that we can sand right off. I'm also going to add some up here for a little bit of depth behind our clouds. All right, cool. All right, so next I'm going to move on to the volcano itself. This is a fun one because we can get really angular and freestyle with it, um, which is, is what I'm gonna do. I, I really like it when things have a lot of texture and you can see we have several moments, you know, this part of the volcano passes through everything, the ocean here, the sky here, and we're gonna make it, we're gonna bring it forward by again, just sort of flattening out everything that's sort of surrounding it. So first we're gonna go through, and carve the edge of the volcano. And this will really clean it up quite a bit. Oh yeah, we have a big clay booger in this corner. I'm very happy to get rid of. All right, so even just carving that outline around the volcano really made it pop a bit more. But again, it still looks really, really 2D at this stage. So we are gonna fix that. First, we're gonna go back in with our flat edge again, going back into the background. And so I'm really drawing out the runway for this um, sharp sort of transition between, you know, the sky and the volcano or the sky and the sea. And that makes it a little more subtle, a little less noticeable when everything is glazed and done. Now here we have the sort of opposite thing in the front of the volcano. Technically the ocean is in front of the volcano, but we can still continue carving as it is because we are gonna be sort of rounding out all of the transitions, both between the background and the foreground. So. All right, so even with just the sort of background done, it's already starting to look a little bit better. Um, now we're going to take that, take that same energy and do that with the volcanic lump. And the one place where I am not going to round it out is this edge. And in fact, I'm doing a little pass to make this edge even sharper. Because of course, when a volcanic eruption occurs, sometimes it just blasts off the top part of a mountain. So there's no gentle rounding to that. And now, to make my, my mountain look, you know, pretty 3D, I, I did a pretty 
abbreviated carving of this side, but again, we'll clean that up with a sponge. This front part, I really want it to look like it's behind the ocean. So that's gonna be a little more of a, let's say subtle transition. I'm gonna do a wider plane of fading back from, from the cut. And it's, you know, using the same tool and the same motion, but just over sort of a, a wider plane. And with this sponge, I'm really dragging where my texture was to just blend, blend, blend. I really want this to be a convincing sort of 3D little eye trick once it's glazed. So we're getting there. You're seeing how that can maybe look dynamic and, and you know, in depth once it's glazed. But it's also, you know, the mountain itself is super boring. So what we're gonna do is add some textures, add some crags. Let's see how we're doing. Right. So I had previously added a little bit of a crag here. And let's see, a little crag here. And one thing that I like about drawing volcanoes and mountains is like you have a lot of leeway for the features on these things. And when we think about what Celadon does, again, pulls and gets darker when we have deeper cuts. Um, I'm sort of thinking about what I want the volcano to look like based on that. So first I'm gonna do my, my deep cuts where I wanna sort of maybe indicate that there's some, you know, sort of fissure in the mountain, um, that sort of a thing. So that gives us a little something to work with. Um, I'm gonna go through again and with my flat side, just take away some of those sharp edges. And here, I have a little, a little mini, mini hill. And so I'm gonna remove the area behind it so it looks like we have a little in-depth hill in front of the mountain. And then again, yeah, these are a little crumbly, a little more crumbly than I'd like, but that's all right. Um, you know, hopefully all that dark celadon will cover that. And now I do want to add a texture all over the mountain. Um, you know, this really wouldn't be um, a piece of mine if I didn't just cover entire sections and in too much texture. So I'm gonna continue using this tool, but with a much lighter and shorter hand. So I'm just gonna carve a little nice texture over the whole mountain. And this is another great way to add depth by just, you know, blowing out the whole surface of a part with a varied texture. So because we took the time to really make like this shape was in the foreground, even though we're carving texture, which is gonna give it probably sort of a medium celadon tone, it'll be surrounded by sort of a darker line that'll hopefully really push it forward. And this slab is still soft enough that maybe I will transform this into like a little platter or something. Or maybe I'll just, you know, call it a trivet and call it a day. A tibet trivet. Um, so 
for anybody who does have firing access outside of Greenwich House, or for anybody who likes to fire at cone six at Greenwich House, um, there are some, well, there's plenty of translucent or clear glazes on the market today that act like celadons without being like true iron-based celadons where you get a great result every time. Amico has an entire line of cone six celadons that I think are really great. Yeah, there we go. See, that's popping a little. That's looking what I want it to look like. And now we're gonna move on to here. Um, so if you wanted this, but like purple instead of green, those Amico cone six celadons come in pretty much any color. So um, they're great. So with our, with our puffy clouds, you know, we really want those to look round and fluffy and puffy. So this is gonna be quite a feat. First I'm going through by carving that line away again. The line in this case between the volcanic clouds and the sky in the background. And this is just gonna allow me to let the sky recede a little bit and bring that volcanic cloud forward. So I just sort of faded out the sky a little bit. Definitely a little more crumbly than I would like it to be, but you know, we'll live with it. Um, but also, of course, this leaves our clouds looking a little on the flat side. But oh, let's see, yeah, maybe I will go through with this. So I'm just gonna take just the edge of these clouds down just a little bit, just to round them out and make them look like evocative of a puffy round shape instead of just a cut out circle that's been brought forward. All right, so there we cut out some detail and now we're gonna, we're gonna round that out a bit. Again, starting with underneath, I want this part to be a really smooth transition. So I'm gonna make that draw out over, over a little bit of a, a little bit of real estate. In uh, later celadon traditions, particularly in Korean applications of celadons, you will sometimes see these gorgeous green celadon pieces that also have like a black surface covering, that kind of a thing. And that's something that with a project like this, you could achieve with underglazes on certain parts or slips. And I will say that um, the red underglaze that in non-pandemic times is carried in the liaison's office, that does stay color true up to cone 10 and it also really pops through celadon. So you get this really nice like minty green, bright red color situation that I think just looks fantastic. All right, so I just cut out underneath my cloud details. I still have to do the top of the cloud details, but you can see I tried to make that a pretty smooth transition. So we have a pretty deep cut, but it's a pretty smooth transition. So now I'm gonna do the top part. All right, so there we go, some clouds. And um, then because I do really like to sometimes combine sort of more like line work with our sort of efforts at 3D, I am going to show some additional depth to these clouds by adding little lines that 
will denote more shadow than we would perhaps get with just celadon alone. So to do that, I'm gonna go along the lower part of the cloud. Now you can picture if a big 3D puffy cloud is in the sky, the underside of it might have a bit of a shadow. And then the underside of these puffy overhangs might have a shadow. So to do that, I'm just gonna bang out a series of, of you know, short, thin lines that will hopefully just add to our design a little bit. All right, so there's our first pass at shadow, and then I'm just gonna do one on the underside. These clouds. All right. That's that. So we have sort of a combo 3D and um, sort of more illustrative effort. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot of texture in there. Things will pop forward. So yeah, I'll be excited to pop this through a kiln, get some celadon on it, and um, see how it looks. So I think that's about it for today. Let's see what time it is. Oh, yeah, just about an hour in. So uh, yeah, I hope everybody's staying healthy out there, staying safe, and email me if you have any questions. All right, have a great week, and I will see you next Wednesday. Bye.